Basking in the sunshine at RAF Cosford Aerospace Museum, it's hard to put into perspective. But 50 years ago, this machine was embroiled in the most violent and deadly six-year period in the whole span of human history. 50 years ago, this Messerschmitt 410 was one of the tools of aggression with which Adolf Hitler planned to subdue the Western world. In 1942, hundreds of ME-410s darted through the skies of Europe with one purpose and one purpose only, to destroy the men and the machines of war that encircled Germany. Appropriately, these aircraft and the line from which they sprang were known by Luftwaffe pilots as the destroyers. What makes the destroyer story so important is that in many ways its evolution mirrors the fortunes, needs and misfortunes of the Luftwaffe itself. Destroyers were not one particular aircraft, but rather an entire class. And because they were put to so many uses, escort, tank destroyer, night fighter, they may have been the most versatile, most ambitious planes of the war. The destroyer line was first incarnated in the Messerschmitt Bf 110. Originally intended as a bomber escort, the 110 embarked on its maiden flight in 1936. But it took several years of hard work before the twin-engine craft was ready for service. In the years leading up to the war, the destroyer's greatest champion was none other than Luftwaffe Reich Marshal Hermann Göring. This former World War I ace, steadily preparing his forces for the inevitable conflict, keenly recognized the ascendance of air power and intended gathering the most formidable arsenal the world had ever seen. This is a Junkers 86. As one of the Luftwaffe's first monoplane bombers, its survival hung precariously on the armaments it carried into battle. That vulnerability led military planners to search for ways of giving expensive bombers like the 86 a better chance of coming back. When more powerful engines arrived on the scene, there was great hope that the next generation of German bombers might actually be able to outrun enemy fighters. The Dornier DO-17 was the manifestation of that optimism. Constructed with very light armor, the plane was for a bomber really quite nimble. Because of its curious shape, the DO-17 was quickly dubbed the flying pencil by the Luftwaffe pilots who flew her. The Dornier's closest peer at the time was a highly advanced bomber called the Heinkel HE-111. German strategists fantasized that in the coming conflict, fleets of such warplanes would rule the skies and soon thereafter the ground below. But with these hopes came concern. Lessons in Spain, paid for in airmen's lives, had taught the Luftwaffe that these speedy bombers were still very vulnerable to enemy fire. The solution was clear. Bomber fleets would need long-range escort fighters to accompany them. Only then could the slashing thrusts of attacking enemy fighters be blunted. The idea of a long-range escort fighter was not entirely new. In America, Bell Aircraft had struggled with the concept and come up with an answer of its own. The extreme range required for such missions would only be feasible with large twin-engined aircraft, even bigger than many bombers of the time. The Aracuda was Bell's first endeavor in this direction and displayed several novel features, including propellers placed at the rear of the wings. This allowed the front of each engine nacelle to pack the hidden sting of a gunner and a large caliber cannon. The massive fighter never made it onto the production line, but the company's next product, the P-39 Aero Cobra, did go on to carry thousands of Russian pilots into combat on the Eastern Front. But with existing technology, an effective dual-engine fighter was still not feasible. At the time, technology dictated that aircraft, high-performance aircraft, be constructed almost entirely from metal, aluminium, steel. That was the stuff that military planes should be made of. In aviation manufacturing, wood was rapidly being relegated to the past. And by the late 1930s, that transition was almost complete. Yet there were still some who persisted in favoring the lightness provided by wood construction. Future designs would vindicate them in their stand. This remarkable aircraft was designed by the famous Dutchman Anthony Fokker. Designated model G1, 
it was better known as the mower. And unfortunately for its targets, that had nothing to do with the sound it made, but rather indicated just what its guns would do to anything in its way. Twin-engined, multi-seated, multi-missioned, it fitted the destroyer concept perfectly. Fokker's design was extremely agile, something few destroyers could really boast. Ironically, this was partly due to the plane's wooden wings. Unfortunately for the Dutch, very few were built by the time of the German invasion. September the 1st, 1939. German troops swarm across the Polish border in bold mobile strikes that stun the panicked defenders. And a new kind of warfare is born. The Germans called it Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. Polish lines are rapidly penetrated by highly mobile German panzer divisions. Under intense aerial bombardment, soldiers and civilians alike are sent reeling by a new German terror weapon the Stuker dive bomber. Germany's twin-engine bombers, unchallenged by Poland's antiquated air force, fly with impunity and wreak destruction on Polish cities. Messerschmitt 110s, freed of their escort duties, are able to assume an offensive role as ground attack aircraft. But Poland was only the first. Soon Nazi aggression consumed Norway, Belgium, Holland and France. Nations with inadequate air forces, unable to challenge a Luftwaffe that dominated the skies over every single battle it entered. These were all conflicts relatively close to the fatherland. Many airfields were quickly taken by German ground troops. Others were lost by simple incompetence. But as the war spread, Allied commanders learned hard lessons. There would be no more easy victories for the Luftwaffe. The next target was Britain. Saved from the fate of the rest of Europe by a narrow band of water called the English Channel. And just as important, the British had the Royal Air Force. If German bombers were to bring England to her knees, Messerschmitt destroyers would have to escort them. The British had one other quite ingenious card up their sleeves, radar. With it, Aria fighters could locate incoming bombers almost invariably. A showdown of sorts had arrived between the RAF Spitfire and Goering's unproven escort. Caught momentarily without escort, German bombers like this HE-111 were easy prey. From nearby, 110s close in to defend the bomber and with the advantage of height, target the Spitfire. But this film shot from a 110s gun camera illustrates the destroyer's basic flaw. Over 60 miles per hour slower than the British plane, they could never outmaneuver the single-engine fighters. The Spitfire simply flies out of reach. In a few desperate days, the theory of Goering's destroyers was tried, tested and abandoned. However, despite failures over England, destroyers acting as ground attack aircraft did make their mark. During the invasion of Russia, they played a vital part in the surprise attacks that practically annihilated the Russian Air Force. Throughout the war, Goering left much of the Luftwaffe planning to another fighter ace from the First World War, Ernst Udet, seen here on the left. Goering asked him, Goering was his uh, comrade in the, in, the, in the fighter squadron of uh, Richthofen, and he asked him, or maybe he forced him in, to the new German Air Force Act, you have to come, you as a hero of World War I, you have to come to this world, and he did. Uh, and he was lucky, I and mean, his life was flying. And uh, then later on he was put in a position where he had to plan all the, the new developments and the new policy 
where we go in our armament, in our equipment. And this was maybe a too heavy load on his shoulders. And uh, then I think, you know, he was a wide and world open cosmopolitan. And I can imagine that obviously he was not too heavy in this very strict political situation he was put in. Udet was instrumental in the development of the Luftwaffe's first dive bomber, the Henschel 123. Originating from an American concept, the biplane Henschel remained in service almost throughout the entire war. The plane that followed the Henschel into production was also championed by Udet. As the next generation dive bomber, for millions, it would come to symbolize Nazi terror in the early years of the war. It's odd to think that the Junkers 87 Stuka was nearly outdated when the war began. In wartime, and quite often in peacetime too, hardly a plane is in service that doesn't have its replacement on a drawing board somewhere. But when the Luftwaffe started looking for a plane to replace the Stuka, they didn't have to look very far. Orders were issued to create a revamped destroyer, able to perform yet another mission, dive bombing. Messerschmitt tackled the challenge head on and came up with one of the war's preeminent multi-missioned aircraft, the ME-210. The 210 was smaller than the 110 and with its short nose, the propellers could fit much closer together. The end result was a more agile aircraft and a better fighter. The new canopy for the two-man crew vastly improved downward vision during ground attacks. However, the aircraft did have some serious problems. The 210 was hopelessly underpowered. And there were also major failings with the undercarriage. But worst of all, the aerodynamics of the wing were entirely wrong. The bulkier 110 was a pilot's plane, easy to handle. On the other hand, the 210 was aerodynamically unstable and very taxing for the pilot. It couldn't maneuver well enough to fight and it was too slow to run. Many 210s fell easy prey to Allied fighters, a scene here recorded by a P-47's gun camera. An embarrassment to both Udet and Goering, the 210 was widely acknowledged as a failure in a system that did not tolerate failure. Goering that time, he had a very bad reputation already throughout the Air Force. He was a man, pompous man, you know, uh, showing off, and uh, he wanted to be what he wasn't. Uh, to be fair, he was, maybe he was a great organizer before the war. He run several political, economical programs, but he was certainly not a strategist about air warfare. He was, he was mistaken. And he, maybe he felt that he uh, hadn't grip and control of the Air Force. Uh, I mean, the Air Force was run by some others. The Messerschmitt ME-410 was virtually indistinguishable from its predecessor, the 210. Solving the 210's handling difficulties was an intensive effort during which the wing and control surfaces were subtly yet substantially refined. The resulting 410 was a much better balanced aircraft and was by far the most advanced of the destroyers. It would also be the last of its kind. The Hornet was a truly innovative machine. In the cockpit, the pilot could look down between his feet for an unobstructed view to the ground below. The plane, small as it was, had an internal bomb bay thus eliminating the drag that external bomb racks caused. The bomb bay could hold two 2,205-pound bombs or eight 110-pound bombs.
adding to this deadly load, room for additional weapons was made by four hard points mounted behind the bomb bay. Engine radiators sat on the outboard of each wing. Movable tabs controlled the airflow. In its day, the Messerschmitt's wing was a marvel of engineering. Not only did it house all the control surfaces, along with the rods, gears and motors that drove them, but hundreds of gallons of aviation fuel as well. These are the leading edge slats adopted for most Messerschmitt designs. And these are the dive brakes. The forward armaments were daunting and consisted of two cannon and four machine guns. The destroyer's defensive sting was controlled by the 410's radio operator. An automated system provided the gunner with a wide scope of fire above and below. Fire to the rear and on both sides of the aircraft was provided by these articulated machine gun barbettes. The first destroyers carried only a single hand-operated machine gun, leaving the entire undercarriage completely unprotected. The 410 Messerschmitt posed a far more lethal threat to attacking enemy fighters. With bigger engines and few of its predecessor's bugs, the 410 was a forbidding aircraft. Nevertheless, one persevering destroyer floor would haunt it time and again. Its power to weight ratio, because the plane was designed to do too many jobs. Ironically, by the time this improved destroyer was ready for action, the Luftwaffe's need for an escort fighter had disappeared. For Germany was no longer the hunter, but the prey. As the war progressed, Messerschmitt destroyer aircraft found themselves pressed into service as defenders. And in that role, their massive firepower would soon devastate American bomber formations. In a tragic gamble, repeated daily, United States 8th Air Force bombers flew to German airspace, well beyond the range of their own escorts. It was hoped that the defensive power of Liberators and B-17s flying in tight boxed formations would deter the German fighters awaiting them. This dramatic footage, actually taken from a destroyer's gun camera, shows what frequently resulted. For a while, twin-engine destroyers were even more effective than the single-engine fighters normally used to intercept Allied planes. The destroyers had greater endurance, and they could stay airborne for up to three and a half hours. Moreover, they packed such immense firepower that during the three and a half hours, they could truly decimate the incoming bombers. But their advantage was to be short-lived. The range of U.S. escorts was constantly increasing, and in close quarters they could chew the Messerschmitt plane to pieces. This 110 is being attacked from below and hasn't the slightest chance of shooting back. And even the sturdy destroyer cannot sustain so many hits and survive.
Although the destroyer suffered badly at the hands of American day fighters, there was another job it would find itself more than equal to. Radar was one of the few technologies in which the Germans lagged far behind the Allies. One of their successes, however, was the Liechtenstein radar with its three large antler antennae. Use of the top secret Liechtenstein meant making room for a specially trained technician and the two-seated destroyer was ideal. Once served by the radar, the resulting aircraft was a truly deadly night fighter. Many of the technicians were first trained in older model bomber aircraft like the HE-111. The reason for all this effort was a pressing one. For when the American 8th Air Force was finished bombing Germany for the day, the RAF would continue the reign of bombs after dusk. Under the cover of darkness, large formations of Lancasters would drone over German cities night after night, for months on end. As German industry suffocated and thousands died, a solution was desperately sought. And as radar equipped night fighters, the destroyers, particularly the 110s, found their most vital and effective role. Their great range enabled them to follow British bombers both to and from the target zone. And they would down thousands before the war was over. Germany wasn't the only nation to develop the multi-role fighter during the war. The British had the Bristol Bow Fighter, powered by two Pegasus radial engines. Reasonably successful in ground attack, the plane proved lethal to naval targets. Yet it was never expected to perform the myriad of tasks set for the German destroyers. Russia's counterpart to the 110 was the PE-2, one of the earliest Soviet aircraft constructed entirely of metal. A very effective ground attack weapon, like the destroyer, it never made it as an escort fighter. The United States had its multi-engine fighter too. The P-38 employed an unusual twin boom shape, similar to the Dutch mower. The lightning, as the British called it, was never designed for a wide range of missions, but was deadly as a single-seat fighter. In addition, the plane could also carry a very small load of bombs. From the outset, the Lightning was designed with one thing in mind, speed. Its two engines didn't have anything to do with safety. They were there for power. Turbo superchargers were installed to get the very last ounce of speed. It's easy to see how important reducing drag and weight was to designers. The aircraft is basically wing and engine, with the pilot shoved in almost as an afterthought. Although one of the largest single-seat fighters of the war, it was one of the most cramped planes a man could fly. Towards the end of the war, some lightnings were modified into night fighters. With a cramped space made even smaller, 
the plane could hardly accommodate the extra man, a problem that Messerschmitt destroyer crews never had. With its two engines, the P-38 was an expensive machine, and it guzzled gas. But that was just fine with the men who flew it, because the aircraft had one advantage that every pilot loves. It was ruggedly dependable. Conventional wisdom at the time said that if a plane was to be durable, it would have to be all metal, made of castings and aluminium. Born of heavy industry, by necessity it was a product of the forge, the metal shop and the assembly line. But as always, there was one exception to the rule, the Mosquito. Of wooden construction, it was a brilliant idea that the British almost rejected and only survived because of the acute wartime metal shortage. The Mosquito was not really a destroyer. It was produced in several different versions, each very good at its assigned tasks. But all of the planes had one common trait. Their light but strong airframes, which made them so fast there was no need for defensive armaments. In fact, the Luftwaffe so respected the Mosquito that they started building one of their own. Fock Wolf was assigned the task and its goal was to build a twin-engined wooden aircraft with a power-to-weight ratio equal to the British machine. Under the guidance of Kurt Tank, the company embarked on the daunting task of designing and constructing a 400 miles an hour aircraft in just 10 months. Achieving this meant developing an entirely new process of molding wood in huge presses. The airframe had to be worked to extremely fine tolerances, because if wood was to substitute for metal, everything had to fit perfectly. The other ingredient essential to the project's success was a new synthetic resin called Tigo film. This was the real key, because it bonded the wood with the necessary strength to cope with the stresses of landing and takeoff. One of the greatest obstacles was the simple fact that the art of mass producing wooden planes had been lost over the years. Yet in an incredibly short time, workers would have to be trained to produce a finished aircraft ready to bear German pilots into battle. One of the greatest benefits of wooden construction was that the protruding rivets inherent in metal aircraft were no longer needed. The result was a much smoother, more aerodynamic shape. But the abundance of wood and the plane's resulting lightness weren't the only factors that spurred on the project. To Luftwaffe commander Hermann Göring, the 154, as the plane was called, had become an obsession. British mosquitoes inspired both fear and respect in the Luftwaffe pilots who faced them. In time, this became so deeply rooted that Goering felt compelled to counter the plane with an even better version of his own. This compulsion went so far that the 154 officially took the British name, Mosquito. Kurt Tank always thought that the German Mosquito was suitable for many missions. At one stage it nearly took on the role of high-speed bomber. But as the intensity of RAF raids increased, 
its night fighter role became vital. But the same problems that haunted the early destroyers returned to plague the 154. Luftwaffe pundits insisted that the aircraft be capable of playing two different roles, mosquito chasing and night fighting. By accepting this compromise, Tank was able to get his program underway at a time when many other projects were either languishing or being terminated altogether. Not the type to run things from afar, Tank personally supervised the final preparations of the first Mosquito. On July the 1st, 1943, the first TA-154 rolled out onto the field at Langenhaven. The smooth wooden surface and clean lines belied the lethal nature of its mission. All involved held high hopes for its future, reckoning that here was the plane that could face down the British Mosquito. With Hans Sanders at the control and Walter Schorn in the back seat, the 154 took to the air on its maiden flight. The plane lifted quickly off the ground. But when Sanders tried to retract the undercarriage, the nose wheel locked in the halfway position. Frantically, Sean struggled with the emergency system, but to no avail. The gear finally locked down, only under the impact of landing. Despite minor problems, the 154 project made steady progress. But then, it came to a halt one night, when British bombers unknowingly did themselves a service by attacking the town of Wuppertal destroying the factory that made the Tiger film resin. Designers desperately searched for a substitute. What they found, however, was a compound that actually ate into the wood. In their haste to keep the project rolling, several planes crashed in testing. Tank had no choice but to suspend production. For this prudent act, he was tried by Goering on a charge of sabotage. But even in Nazi Germany, that was considered a bit far-fetched and shortly thereafter the charges and the 154 project were dropped. There were other reasons for the Mosquito's demise. Chief among these was the fact that another night fighter, the Heinkel 219, was already in production. And given that Hitler placed an absurd emphasis on offensive aircraft, there was little likelihood that the 154 would ever truly enter production. The German Mosquito, one of the best attempts at an effective dual-engined, multi-mission fighter, came to naught. The Dornier 335 was Nazi Germany's final and most novel attempt to exploit fully the potential of dual-engine piston power. Although not a destroyer itself, the plane was slated to perform a myriad of tasks, many of which mirrored those taken on by the destroyer aircraft. The 335, called the Arrow because of its cruciform tail assembly, featured a unique propeller arrangement with one fore and one aft of the fuselage. The power of both engines was applied not to the wing, but directly to the fuselage. This centerline thrust concept made it the fastest piston-powered aircraft in history. The Arrow would have been produced in at least two separate versions, a single-seat fighter-bomber and a two-seat night fighter.
captured arrows amazed the American troops who saw them. Curiously enough, at one time German engineers seriously considered joining two of the planes together at the wing and tail. Their hope was to create what would have been an extremely fast four-engine bomber. Another impressive machine was Heinkel's HE-219. Like the 110, it too used the Liechtenstein Antler radar. Shown here after capture by the Americans, the 219 was probably the best night fighter of the Second World War. Never produced in vast numbers, it was nevertheless effective. An effectiveness undiluted by having to play a variety of roles. Another specialized weapon with just as much clarity of intent was the twin-engined Henschel 129. Not terribly fast because it didn't have to be. It was a true ground attack aircraft. In Russia, when the Wehrmacht began to crumble before the Red Army's onslaught, the 129 decimated Soviet tank columns all along the Eastern Front. Western Front, despite suffering dreadful losses early in the campaign, American bombers continued their daily raids against German industrial targets. Although 8th Air Force fighter escorts had slowly extended their range, the final leg of many US bombing missions left the Liberators and Flying Fortresses totally unprotected. Before they had the escort, you know, the 8th uh, Air Force suffered from heavy losses, up to 10-15% emission. You cannot take it for, for, for a long time. I think the, the most proficient aircraft, the best one, was a P-51. And you know that the, the big advantage of all those aircraft against the term, the first term, was endurance. They flew for seven hours, eight hours, and we for our one hour twenty. So when you get your red light, he was just ready to start the fight, you know? And when you came down to somewhere to find an airfield, and when you came in, dropped the gear, and they circled around, you know, and they just got you in the final approach. We lost many of them in the final approach. Like the British Mosquito, America's P-51 struggled against cancellation from the very beginning. But two modifications would transform it into one of the best fighters of the war. The 51 was fitted with a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which made it faster than any other piston-powered fighter in combat. At high altitude, it was nearly invincible. The second improvement literally changed the course of the air war. A cavity behind the P-51's pilot seat was adapted to house a large extra fuel tank. The extra fuel meant one very important thing. Highly maneuverable P-51's could now fly to Berlin and back. Like the destroyers, P-51's also performed tactical missions, attacking just about anything that moved in the fields below once their escort job was done. By this time, the Allied aircraft reigned supreme. So, were the destroyers a failure? Probably yes. But the real fault lay not with the machines, but with the men who so drastically convoluted their purpose. Fighter bomber, escort, dive bomber, night fighter, no one plane could possibly be all of those. The problems with underpowered engines, faulty aerodynamics, and widely varied armaments reflected attempts by the Luftwaffe bureaucracy to design a jack-of-all-trades. 
the price for this indecision was high. With better machines, many Luftwaffe pilots who didn't make it would have surely survived the war. One particular casualty was Ernst Udet. Following the ME 210 debacle, he took his own life. The 210's failure was a particularly ugly episode. In fact, certain high-ranking members of the Luftwaffe insisted upon the resignation of Willy Messerschmitt himself. But they never got it. The 210 wasn't just an embarrassment. Conservative estimates indicate the cost of the Luftwaffe as some 600 aircraft. Upon his capture, Goering is reputed to have claimed bitterly that he might have lived longer were it not for the 210. Ironically, the search for a long-range escort aircraft didn't end in a twin-engine plane as the Germans had planned. Instead, the answer was much simpler. The P-51, a single-seat, single-engine fighter that the Americans simply crammed with fuel. As an attack aircraft, the destroyer's role was probably best manifested in another Allied plane, the wooden British Mosquito. Ironically, the P-51 and Britain's Mosquito were so unappreciated at the time that they both narrowly escaped being scrapped. But Messerschmitt's credibility was impeccable, and for that reason the company had the luxury of being able to fail. But the company was no stranger to success. And during the course of the war, one legendary Messerschmitt practically filled the skies. Called the ME-109, over 30,000 were built. One of Messerschmitt's more revolutionary planes was the 163 Comet, still the only rocket aircraft ever to go to war. The achievements of the 163 paved the way for supersonic flight. Another brave step into the unknown was Messerschmitt's Gigant. Requiring no less than three destroyer planes and rocket assistance to get it into the air, the Gigant remains one of the largest gliders that ever flew. Messerschmitt reached the pinnacle of achievement with its breakthrough in jet technology. Its ME-262 jet fighter blazed the trail into a new era. It was thought by many to be the world's best combat jet well into the 1950s. By far the fiercest adversary Allied planes faced in the war was the Messerschmitt 262. Over 150 miles an hour faster than the most nimble Allied fighters, they were only vulnerable if caught on the ground. The logical extension of the jet fighter was the jet bomber. And with the arrival of the Arado 234, the escort fighter became obsolete. This speedy bomber, faster than any enemy fighters in the sky, transformed predictions a decade old But in the mid-1930s, before the jet came into its own, high speeds, long ranges and heavy fuel loads meant having a plane with two engines. And the bulk that this created in the end was the downfall of the destroyer line. The original 110s were almost as big as the 111 bombers they were sent to escort. This made them easy prey to single-engined enemy fighters. The smaller 210 was more nimble, but it suffered from dual personalities, ground attack aircraft and dive bomber. 
In spite of its faulty aerodynamics and terribly weak engines, a thousand were ordered straight off the drawing board. When the 410 came on the scene, refinements in the wing and more powerful engines had finally produced the kind of destroyer the Luftwaffe had been searching for. But by then, the thought of German escorts and bombers droning over Allied lands was bitterly ironic. The drone of Allied bombers over German soil was a constant reminder that the Third Reich was finished.